So this seminar is really concerned with liability for work-related stress and psychiatric injury in the more extreme and the more extraordinary work situations. And they don't get more extraordinary than the situation we're in at the moment. But I'm not just looking at common law liability for the personal injury itself. Um, I'm also concerned with any potential employment law claims and possibly any criminal liability that may arise from an employer's failure to protect their employees from stress at work. And this is in particular for coll collective failures rather than individual failures. So what do I mean when I talk about extraordinary work situations? Well, first of all, I'm talking about things like internal investigations. These might be ongoing um, disciplinary procedures or grievance procedures. Um, extreme work conditions, and this really relates to working hours, um, shift patterns, and the physical work environment. Another area is the work culture. So this is, is it a competitive work environment? Are people encouraged to compete to um, to make sure that they meet their certain targets? Is there a culture of competition and arguably fear? Um, extreme types of work. So this is the type of work that's particularly sensitive, where you have individuals who might be working, for example, with abuse victims or with rape victims or working with particularly distressing material. Okay. Now, the current climate and COVID-19 forcing us all to work from home is actually forcing changes in some of those areas, if not all of them. And in particular, in respect of the physical work environment, the hours and the type of work we're doing. But more importantly, it's compromising the employer's ability to monitor and support their employees because they're not in a physical workplace. Um, and it is in some cases leading to internal processes like grievances and disciplinaries that have been ongoing to be stalled. So the real question is, in the current climate, what is the extent of the employer's duty in such situations? And what is their exposure to liability? And the liability that I'm going to be looking at is not just common law liability, but for disability discrimination in the employment sphere. And finally, whether there's any potential for criminal liability in accordance with the health and safety executive standards for stress at work. So in terms of general principles, what we know is that you, there needs to be a breach of duty by the employer. Um, the claimant has to establish causation, so the breach has to actually cause the loss. And there needs to be foresight of harm. Now, Barbara and Somerset is the leading case, still is, on psychiatric injury the common law. And in Barbara and Somerset, in terms of foresight of harm, it was said that it would not usually be foreseeable that where you have an employee of normal fortitude with no known or pre-existing history of psychiatric ill health, it would not usually be foreseeable um, that they would be at risk of suffering from some sort of psychiatric condition as a result of something happening in the workplace in the absence of any other specific indicators. So in other words, what that meant in reality is that claimants would struggle to establish foresight of harm if either they didn't have any pre-existing history of psychiatric illness or they may have had a pre-existing history but their employer never knew about it. Um, and from subsequent cases, such as the case of Deadman and Bristol City Council, um, no foresight of harm was established, for example, in the ordinary operation of the employer's procedure. This was a case where the employer was launching an investigation of sexual harassment allegations. The first investigation was effectively inconclusive and was shut down. And then the investigation was resurrected again and the employee was informed that it was being resurrected in a really insensitive manner, um, effectively just a letter left on their desk. And foresight of harm um, in the context of the ordinary operation of the employer's internal procedures was not established. And we also know from subsequent cases that no one particular profession is deemed inherently more stressful than another. So for example in Hartman in South Essex, um, caring for children with learning difficulties wasn't deemed to be um, any more um, risky or render employees any more vulnerable or impose any higher standard of vigilance for the risks of psychiatric harm on an employer.
Okay, well, let's have a look at breach of duty. And I want to talk about extreme work conditions and an extreme work environment. What kind of extreme work conditions and environment might attract liability? And probably the best illustrative example of this is the case of Lewis versus the Ministry of Justice. Now, this was an employment tribunal claim but there could also have been common law liability um, for the psychiatric injury cause. Now, in this case, the employee, the claimant, um, was responsible for effectively debriefing a murderer who had turned into a police informant, and he was informing about terrorist activities. Okay, So the subject matter was quite detailed, in some places quite traumatic. The employee had signed the Official Secrets Act, so she was forbidden from discussing her work with anybody else. And that's relevant to the question of what support measures or mechanisms were available to her. There were also problems with her working hours because she found herself working 12 hour plus shifts and was often having to be away from home for more than two weeks at a time, working sort of 10 to 14 consecutive days without proper days off in between. And there were problems with the physical work environment because she was effectively working in a confined space, a complex that consisted of the prisoner's cell and a tiny interview room. She eventually went off sick and developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And she brought an unfair dismissal claim against her employer because she was ultimately dismissed on the grounds of ill health capability. Now, not only was her dismissal upheld as being unfair by the employment tribunal, but the employer was also criticised for failing to make reasonable adjustments after she had received her diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder in order to get her back into the workplace. What the employment tribunal said is that the employer asked itself the wrong questions. When it was speaking and engaging with occupational health, it was so focused on what the employee couldn't do that it completely missed what the employee could do. The employee was still capable of working from home. Measures could have been put in place where, for example, she had a colleague to provide her with support or to take over some of her duties, but none of those were exposed by the employer. And, and that case gives you an example of the kind of extremities in work conditions and work environments, etc., that is likely to attract liability. Now, that case could easily have spawned a concurrent claim um, for personal injury in the common law jurisdiction. Um, because when you have individual employees who are dealing with very, very sensitive subject matter, it always carries with it the risk of what's called collateral damage and collateral damage is really the secondary trauma that's suffered by employees so for example if you have an employee that's having to um, consistently and very often review video footage of traumatic events they can actually sustain a form of ptsd because they're li reliving the trauma in the same way that if you have an employee that's having to interview victims of abuse or victims of assault they are effectively reliving the trauma every time they hear the account that's what's called secondary trauma or collateral damage and employers are always vulnerable to that sort of risk the employer in the case of Lewis and MOJ would have been guilty of several breaches around the workspaces and the working hours and the working conditions. And in that situation, I think it would have been fairly easy to establish foresight of harm because the conditions were so extreme and because in particular, um, the subject matter and what she was dealing with. And remember, she was dealing with actually a very violent and dangerous offender were also so extreme. So what does that mean for employers and their duties over the work environment during the lockdown? Well, it's more difficult for employers to control the work environment because everybody's now working from home. But what employers can and should do is ensure that their employees have the proper work equipment. And if that means that you have to provide um, employees with a desk or with a suitable work chair that they're going to be sitting on for several hours a day, um, then all those considerations that would have applied had the employees been in the office will still apply at home. You still have to provide them with safe workspaces and a safe work area. Think as well about work pressures. 
if you are working in a profession where there are sales targets or billing targets, as I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, think about whether those targets or the climate requires an adjustment, maybe suspending targets for the foreseeable future so that you reduce the pressure on employees to perform in unusually stressful times. Um, it's also going to require, and this is probably the most important, increased employer vigilance. And that means that you aren't just regularly checking in with your employees and providing line management support and providing supervision, but you need to listen very carefully to what your employees are telling you. So if you have employees raising issues about their workload and they are using expressions like, I am struggling to cope, or I am reaching breaking point. At law, expressions like that are likely to be sufficient to put the employer on notice that this employee is at risk of developing a psychiatric condition as a result of their work. Um, the other thing you should be alert to are things like uncharacteristic behaviours, and in particular, the, mo the more telling ones are two things. First of all, Often, if an employee is developing a stress-related psychiatric condition, that can manifest physically before it manifests psychiatrically. So you may have an employee that's unusually susceptible to getting ill, to getting a lot, a lot of infections. So you might actually have somebody suffering from a number of physical conditions who was ordinarily a very, very healthy employee. That's the first thing. The second characteristic to look out for is a reduction, decline in reliability. So if, for example, you have an employee that was always very punctual, had a very good work output rate, would always deliver work on time and of good quality, and that has declined quite markedly, that might be an indicator that there is something else going on. And that is exactly the kind of thing that would require you as the employer to make further inquiries of the employee. I want to now talk about what we do when we have investigations. And these are investigations in the more extreme circumstances, so sexual misconduct, sexual harassment allegations, potentially allegations that deal with abuse issues or child protection issues that might also lead to potential criminal prosecution. Okay, well, the short answer is that employers can be liable for their acts or omissions during the course of running an investigation if those acts or omissions are extreme enough as to render it foreseeable that the employee might suffer from psychiatric harm as a result. Now what do I mean by that? Well I want to look first of all, if we rewind the clock back for a few years, the case of YAP versus the FCO, and this is from 2014. This is the case of the British High Commissioner in Belize who had false allegations of sexual misconduct made against him. He was summarily withdrawn from post while the misconduct allegations were investigated, and it tend did actually take quite a long time to have them investigated and ultimately they were unequivocally withdrawn because it turned out that um, his political opponents were effectively um, pursuing an agenda against him which included ensuring that false allegations of sexual misconduct were made against him. The problem is that in the meantime the employee became ill with clinical depression and subsequently re retired from post. Now our general understanding of stress at work is that it really does relate to workload and work targets but it was said in YAP by the Court of Appeal that liability um, and the barber approach to stress at work cases can be extended to one-off acts of unfairness by the employer and that can include things like the imposition of a disciplinary sanction or taking too long to conduct an internal investigation but there's no absolute rule in either case so in principle an employer's conduct for a one-off event might be so devastating that it should have been foreseeable that a person of ordinary robustness who's got no pre-existing psychiatric history might develop a depressive illness as a result. Um, but that has two important caveats. Firstly, it would be exceptional, an exceptional situation for an otherwise ordinarily robust employee with no history of psychiatric ill health to then develop a depressive illness. But also what is required is that the employer really does something so extreme and so egregious 
um, as to create a foreseeable risk of injury. And in the present case, there was nothing sufficiently egregious in the employer's conduct to establish foresight of harm from their breach of duty. However, let's move forward to 2018, the High Court case of Piepenbrock versus the London School of Economics. Now, this is one of those claims that was made in dual jurisdictions. So the personal injury claim was issued in the High Court, but running alongside that were employment tribunal proceedings as well against the employer. But I want to focus on the High Court PI proceedings. Now, this is a case of an individual, senior individual academic, um, against whom allegations of inappropriate sexual conduct were made by a teaching assistant. Um, and not only that, the teaching assistant then disseminated the details about her allegations and the alleged misconduct um, throughout the teaching faculty. So effectively made the details of it known. Now, the individual claimant subsequently became ill and left the university. But there were issues because the investigation was taking an inordinately long amount of time. Um, Part of that was caused by the fact that the employee was refusing really to engage or participate in the investigation. But what was interesting is that after the employee became ill, he was subsequently diagnosed with borderline narcissistic personality disorder. And one of the unique traits of this disorder is that an individual has extreme or very extreme reactions to what they perceive as criticism. And this is something the university had no idea about. Um, this wasn't an individual who had a pre-existing psychiatric um, history as far as they knew. But the claimant was alleging that the university breached its duty of care in two particular ways. Firstly, by taking too long to investigate the complaints, the sexual harassment complaints. So that was delay. And the second is by failing to act promptly to stop the teaching assistant from disseminating the details um, to the wider faculty members whilst an investigation was ongoing. Interestingly, the court found that in both of those cases, breach of duty was actually established. So in other words, an employer can be held liable if it delays too long, particularly when dealing with an investigation of this nature, because investigations into things like abuse and sexual misconduct tend to cause a higher degree of distress to the individual. However, the claim failed on foresight of harm because even though the university had breached its duty of care, um, the court found that because there wasn't any relevant information available to the university about the claimant's condition prior to his being diagnosed, and furthermore, there was nothing particular in its conduct in his conduct to suggest to the university that this individual was particularly vulnerable to a stress reaction or adverse psychiatric reaction. Um, the court couldn't conclude that the nature of the university's breaches were sufficient to create the foreseeable risk of harm. And that begs the question really, what degree of information does the employer need to know about a particular condition? Um, well, I think it's helpful at this stage to refer to the case of Donna Lean and Liberata. This came before the Court of Appeal in 2018. And this was a case, it's, it's actually quite common, of an individual who had several periods of absence, but a lot of them were for unrelated conditions. So there were some absences related to work-related stress, but equally there were some absences related to hypertension, stomach problems, etc., which begged the question, what is an employer to make of all of that. Remember that employers are not doctors, they're not psychiatrists, they are laymen. Um, and this was further complicated by the fact that there was an occupational health report that said all of the employees' problems were managerial, not medical. So the employer adopted essentially a fourfold approach to inform itself about the nature of an employee's condition. And it was an approach that was endorsed and approved, approved by the court. And the, employee, uh, and the court found that the employer could not be expected to do anything more than that in the circumstances. What was the fourfold approach or the four areas that the employer looked at? First area was what was the medical information available? So what do the sick notes tell us? And um, are there any correspondences from the GP or any other treating doctors? So what specifically medical information do we have? The second thing they looked at were the occupational health reports. The third thing they looked at was what they actually knew about the employee, what they knew about the employee's behaviours, about 
his family background, about his work background. So brought that knowledge into bear. And finally, they looked at and observed the employee's behaviours and his comments um, in internal meetings that they were having with him when they were managing the sickness absence. It's what I like to call the holistic approach. Um, an employer really should be doing all of those things to try and inform itself of the nature of someone's condition or to inform itself that this is somebody who might very well be at risk of being pushed over the edge from suffering a stress reaction to actually suffering a clinically diagnosable psychiatric condition. Um, but that was an aside. Coming back to investigations, what is it that employers should be doing in respect of internal investigations that are ongoing during COVID-19 lockdown? Well, first of all, I don't think you can simply suspend, suspend internal investigations until the lockdown is lifted. Um, we're optimistic that it's going to be lifted soon, but it's not a guarantee. Um, it's been going on for quite a while, and I don't think that courts will find it an acceptable reason for delay um, that we simply do nothing during the lockdown, particularly because we are able to work, we have electronic resources, and particularly because, for example, the courts are still running, albeit in a limited form. So. Um, whilst I think the courts will be sympathetic to things taking longer than they ordinarily would because of lockdown, um, I don't think any employer can get away with effectively stalling or stopping temporarily an internal process to be resumed again once lockdown has lifted. Um, if you do that, I think you're at risk of being found to be in breach of duty. The second thing, thing to think about is that the concept of the normal fortitude of an employee has now changed. So ordinarily, you would think, well, I, I, I have an employee who has no pre-existing psychiatric injury, so I'm going to judge them by the standards of an employee of normal fortitude. But the definition of normal fortitude has changed because these are such extreme times. People are feeling more stressed. People are feeling more scared, more anxious generally, and that makes them more vulnerable to a stress reaction and therefore a psychiatric injury reaction. So employers have to be aware that you're no longer dealing with people who are of normal fortitude, as that used to mean. Normal fortitude has a different meaning. People are much more sensitive. So if you have internal investigation processes, you can conduct things like witness interviews remotely. But also it's worth considering whether you actually appoint an external investigator. Um, and you might want to do that for two reasons. First of all, if you've furloughed a number of your employees, you might automatically have a reduced um, workforce anyone, anyway, so you don't have somebody suitable available to conduct an investigation. But remaining employees may be extremely busy and you don't want to add to their stress and workload by giving them investigation because firstly, the investigation is going to take much, much longer if they're balancing several work commitments. But also you may risk in, in exposing effectively your investigating officer to stress at work because you're giving them a difficult investigation to have to manage on top of managing all sorts of COVID related work. All right, so it might be worth considering an external investigator. And also consider whether you need to put an employee on full suspension. Now, usually when an employee is suspended, um, considerations like whether having them in the workplace poses a risk or whether there's a risk of evidence being tainted because they'll speak to other employees, um, those are the kind of factors that are considered when deciding whether or not to suspend an employee. But if you don't have employees who are physically in the workplace, you shouldn't automatically jump to suspension. An employer should ask themselves, well actually do I need to suspend in the circumstances or can I keep them employed but make it very clear to them that they cannot communicate with other employees for anything other than work issues. Now moving on to causation. Causation is going to be a complicated question. If you have an employee who develops a psychiatric condition during these troubled times, I think it's going to be very difficult for employers and for medical experts to discern whether that condition um, arose because an individual was vulnerable to a stress reaction because of COVID-19 factors, or whether the stress reaction was actually caused by COVID-19 concerns. And there is a difference because liability attaches to the latter, but it doesn't attach to the former. Okay. Now, What's really going to be required here is a detailed forensic examination. And this is more to do with your psychiatric experts than anything the employers can do. But if you have an employee 
who has gone off with what looks like quite a serious psychiatric condition, you might consider whether you want them to be seen by a psychiatrist as opposed to occupational health to give you a better insight into the condition and the reasons for it. So it's about asking the right questions, um, not just what has caused this condition, but a detailed breakdown of what specific factors are causing or contributing to the condition. So for example, um, is the factor of being trapped indoors for 22 hours a day a contributing factor? If it is, can that necessarily be attributed to work or is that COVID related? Um, has the employee developed a psychiatric or anxiety related condition? And one of the symptoms of that is agoraphobia. Because if, if it is agoraphobia, is that agoraphobia actually linked to work and work-related factors? Or is it linked to COVID-related factors? Okay. If you don't have a complete defense on causation, and if it transpires that a psychiatric condition was caused by a combination of COVID and work-related factors, you can still argue for an apportionment of liability. What you can argue is that the psychiatric injury is divisible between tortious and non-tortious factors. Now, those of you who are used to dealing with psychiatric injury claims know that we often run the argument that a psychiatric injury is divisible, but it's actually very, very difficult to run the argument in practice because psychiatric injuries don't lend themselves very well to neat, neat apportionment, not in the same way as a physical injury would. Um, and the courts tend to be quite reluctant to adopt that kind of approach. Um, but, it's not an impossible approach, and, and I actually think it's going to be more important to consider the divisibility of a psychiatric condition post-COVID. Um, and one of the key things that you really do need to ask yourself and ask any expert is how long is this condition going to last? Because if you've got a condition that is in any way linked to COVID at all, with the lockdown expecting to be lifted, can any medical or psychiatric expert really say that this is a condition that's going to be a long-term condition? That this is a condition that's going to last a year or is likely to last a year? That precondition is relevant to the definition of disability under the Equality Act 2010. Now, just to refresh your memory, a disability within the meaning of the Equality Act 2010 is a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial adverse effect on normal day-to-day -day activities and lasts that lasts or is likely to last for one year or more. If an employee develops a psychiatric condition that's COVID related but cannot get any medical practitioner to say at, at the time of diagnosis that this condition is probably going to last for a year, I think the likelihood is that medical practitioners will say, I suspect this is more a short-term condition than a long-term condition, and it's impossible to say how long it's going to last. If an employee can't establish it's going to last for 12 months or more, they do not meet the definition of disability under the Equality Act. And that means that the duties that that entails, such as the duty to make reasonable adjustments in the workplace, doesn't kick in. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be making adjustments in the workplace because, of course, you still have a common law duty of care. Um, but that is an important question. Um, and one other factor that I think is related to COVID. Now, we've all been joking about how we're all drinking more alcohol because we're at home now. It's something to do. We can't go outside, et cetera, et cetera. But one real risk of that is that in the context of certain individuals, it may cause them to develop alcoholism or an alcohol dependency related condition. Um, now, alcoholism is excluded as a disability under the guidance to the Equality Act. So you cannot claim that alcoholism is a disability within the meaning of the Act. But it's actually slightly more complicated or rather nuanced than that. Because if an individual is an alcoholic, but develops a depressive illness or an anxiety related illness as a result of that alcoholism, that psychiatric condition can amount to a disability. Equally, if you have an individual that is suffering from depression or anxiety, and one of the consequences or symptoms of that is alcoholism, the alcoholism will be covered as a disability because it arises out of a genuine psychiatric condition. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, and the final case that I want to talk about is a case that was heard in March 2019 in the Employment Tribunal, but it was a joint PI and employment case. It's the case of Sheeran and Wilson Barker. And this was an employee who was making several allegations of harassment and discrimination, etc., um, and ultimately resigned from her employment. 
she was also bringing a claim for personal injury because she said that post-resignation, she developed complex post-traumatic stress disorder um, and depression. But this was an individual that had a really convoluted and complex pre-existing psychiatric history. Um, the medical evidence, rather the psychiatric evidence before the employment tribunal, was interestingly that this um, condition was caused by a combination of tortious and non-tortious factors. And the non-tortious factors were things like just general office tension or general stress. Um, but the tribunal upheld six out of the 21 specific allegations. Okay, And more importantly, the tribunal concluded that that psychiatric injury was properly divisible as between the tortious and non-tortious factors. In other words, they were prepared to apportion liability for that injury between tortious and non-tortious factors. The only reason they didn't do so is because the claim failed on causation grounds. The medical expert concluded that absent any of these work-related factors, this individual would have developed the condition in any event because of her complex and convoluted pre-existing history. And therefore, the employee couldn't maintain a causal link between developing this condition and what happened at work. Okay, but that just goes to show that perhaps divisibility isn't as difficult an argument to run. And I think it's going to be even more important an argument to run when we look at psychiatric injury claims post-COVID lockdown. Now, the final area I want to deal with very, very briefly, I'm conscious I've gone slightly over time, so thank you for your continuing patience, is the area of criminal liability. Um, the health and safety executive is treating stress at work as a priority area. What they are doing is they are giving their investigation officers specific training in stress at work and the HSE's management standards. And the reason they're doing that is because they are going to crack down on employers who do not implement proper practices for managing stress at work and the mental health of its employees. OK, now you may have heard of the management standards, the HSE's stress management standards. These are the six areas of work design that the HSC has identified as being the factors that contribute to work related ill mental health or the development of mental health conditions and sickness absences. OK, now those management standards are available for free, along with guidance notes on the HSE's website. But the six standards include things like work demands. So work demands are going to be workload, working hours and working patterns. They also include work relationships. So how does an employer not only avoid conflict and promote positive working relationships, but how does the employer deal with unacceptable behavior in the workplace? Okay, um, and it also deals with organizational change. And these can be large scale changes like massive redundancy or smaller changes like a restructure um, in management. But all of that is included. Now there is a possible future amendment to the management standards coming. It is quite possible that in the near future we're going to see step seven added in. And step seven is all about organizational justice. OK, so that's going to be the extent to which employees perceive workplace procedures interactions and outcomes as fair and that will cover things like fair pay, equal opportunities for promotion, personnel selection procedures. In other words, it's more related to the common employment law issues that employment lawyers are having to deal with in the employment tribunal. It is coming soon but I also invite you to note that in October 2019 the HSC issued new criteria for investigating work-related stress. If the HSC receives evidence that a number of staff are experiencing work-related stress or stress-related ill health, that might prompt a HSC investigation. So really they're looking at group claims rather than individual claims. Now, if the HSC receives a complaint, the employer might get an inspection. And if on inspection, it transpires that the employer has no risk assessment in place, or the risk assessment doesn't focus on organizational control of the six management standard areas, they can take enforcement action. And that is important. Now, if the HSE gets bullying and stress cases referred to them, they will 
they will not investigate those. Those will be referred on to ACAS. And similarly, if they get any complaints about discrimination, the HSE won't investigate those. They will be passed on to the Equality and Human Rights Commission. OK, so it's not just about having the right policies in place, but it's about how the organisations and employers take control to manage stress at work. Um, and I think that health and safety prosecutions for stress at work, these are criminal prosecutions, are probably imminent. We're probably going to be seeing them within the next few years. So it's important that employers are aware of the risk of criminal liability, as well as liability at common law and in the employment law sphere. Um, that concludes everything I wanted to talk to you about. Thank you so much. You have been really patient. I note that there are a few um, questions here. Um, one of the questions I've got, I have a question unrelated to psychiatric injury, but related to physical injury, chronic muscle pain, which significantly worsened during this period. How can one in this situation approach their employer with regard to their health concerns? And is your employer even able to help at all in this regard? Well, I think the answer really, and it's the short answer because I don't want to detain you any longer, is to do as much as you would have done and could have done had the employee been in the workplace. Now, it's problematic making an occupational health referral because it's going to be difficult to have a physical examination. So all you can do is encourage the individual to see a medical practitioner so you get more information about their condition. Offer them the chance of an occupational health report so you can understand the condition, so you can understand the triggers. And in particular, get the employee to tell you what are the triggers. Is it the workplace? Is it an uncomfortable chair? Is it working on a computer for several hours at a time? So there is a lot that you still can do in this um, environment. I'm afraid that's a short answer rather than the long answer. And that concludes my seminar. So thank you all for tuning in. The slides will be available um, to you after the seminar and in the chat room. Um, stay safe, stay well, and enjoy the bank holiday weekend. Thanks very much.